there are going to be mutations that are going to arise in this branch and in this branch independently. So in this case, the A is going to latch on you. Uh, the fixated by all my natural selection, whatever mechanism you want to include. Uh, and in this case, it's the B, the one that is going to be the case. So at the end, when you're going to have these two populations that are open, that have uh, this allele picks the A, this allele picks the B, and once they come into contact, the A and the B have never been tested in the same genetic pattern. So what you have here is that have to put those allelos into the A and the B, there is going to be problems and things that are going to go on. The advantage of this particular model is that uh, it's a model that shows how reproductive isolation can actually occur without natural, natural selection opposing any of the steps in this particular instance. But the Dr. Tibiner model was kind of regarded for quite a while. And there were no mathematical treatments about it. It was kind of very anecdotal and right there. But never actually rigorously formulated in a mathematical framework. Until Alcor formulated this corollary of this novel, that's called this novel effect by the Dr. Tibiner model. And what it, what it uh, implies is that the number of genes involved in post-ergonic isolation should evolve faster than linear, should increase faster than linear divergence between the species. And the reason for this is that once you have, assuming that this is time zero, and there are going to be many, many, many mutations in each branch. And for example, in this case, the little b is going to be able, the c is going to be able to interact with the b here, or the little a, and the more time that the species have been apart, we can actually go and, and test whether the number of genes has has increased with time. The advantage of this particular formulation is that it gives us a particular null hypothesis that can be tested to, to formulate and actually study whether the transhumanism model is right. Uh, the problem is that there have there have not been any there have not been any particular and uh, straightforward test for this any of these two particular hypotheses. Just random observations and some rigorous genetic test back then because it didn't only isolated examples. So what do we need to test it with this novel effect? What we need is that at least three species in which you can produce hybrids between for example in this species one and species two and species one and species three. You can count how many hybrid compatibilities are between these two species. Or how many hybrid compatibilities are between these species and these species. Uh, and then you can calculate the expected number of incompatibilities according to the global effect model in between and in between two particular classes. Because you, if, if, you, if you are assigned like, species that have been uh, followed for some time, you will be able to know the divergence time between the two present species. And this, this, this allows us to, to actually formulate a model in which the expected number of incompatibilities is not according to the global effect or according to other hypotheses. Now what you can do for them is you can compare the spectral number and the observed number of them. It's just like that. The thing that just like that has been shown and with people for several reasons. And the reason is that we, can, we don't really have these three species. Or we didn't have these three species in which cross species one and species two, species one and species three, and actually count the number of genes involved in hybrid viability. There have been some attempts to actually correlate the strength of post-ergonic isolation with the number of genes that cause hybrid viability, but that doesn't really count. It's not a good prediction and it's not a good way to test the model. You have to actually count genes. So I use the species from the Melanogaster group in particular. First because I like them quite a lot and second because they produce hybrids. But there are quite like there are four strong reasons for this. The first reason is that the phylogeny of the group is really well resolved. Uh, you will expect that Melanogaster in general terms has, uh, has been studied for quite a while and there are many, many molecular clocks and other techniques that have been set up in order to actually calculate well, what is the divergence time between this. There are also some fossil records that have been used to calibrate the clocks. Second, uh, the Melanogaster, the Drosophila Melanogaster factors, the Drosophila cinemas to produce um, hybrid phenomes that are viable by itself. And this has been pursued quite a lot in terms of finding what genes actually cause possibility isolation. But recently, you know, we discovered that melanogaster also crossed with Drosophila sanguinea, and a species that diverged from melanogaster about 10 million years ago. Melanogaster and similars have diverged about 5 million years ago, so I think that they were, were 
a particular pattern here, and that I can use this to calculate the number of expected numbers of probabilities. And, and also for this, given that there are different divergence times. Uh, third is that we can, uh, this should be, oh no, this is fourth, there was the other hand. Third, uh, fourth, is that the divergence between species can be calculated at a very precise level. And the way to do that was to actually make genomic alignments of the two species and calculate the number of non-signal substitution between melanogaster and simians. And in this case, it's only one. And maybe melanogaster and simians, in this case, it's only 24. Thing is that once you're calculating what when you have the hybrids, is that the hybrids have two different interacting genomes. Sorry And the reason why we're uh, once they have interacting genomes, there are going to be a lot of exotic interactions that are going to go on between the hybrids. Uh, for example, in this case, if you cross the lamasar with Santomea, what you're going to have is a copy of the lamasar and a copy of Santomea together in the same genome interacting with all the benefits and problems that are going to come with that. So to study what kind of static interaction we could study, we, we could find in this particular plot, we used a technique that is kind of, has been used for quite some time that is called efficiency mining. So let me walk you through this. Uh, what actually you get in terms of the hybrids is uh, a copy of, in this case, the, the orange is going to master and the blue the, the green is something there. And the efficiency mapping what does is it erases a piece of the chromosome, it just takes it off. So it allows us to study what genes that are recessed in this particular centimeter copy are going to interact with uh, dominant alleles in the melanomaster genome. And that's what these, what these arrows are symbolizing. In this particular case, given that there is a sufficiency for this chromosomal region, these two recessive alleles are going to be interacting with all these other squares, all genes in the melanomaster. And the way that we actually find about whether there are the design interactions that cause family viability is because, as I was telling you, a deficiency cross, a deficiency in an elastic stuff. That carries also a special chromosome that is called balancer that doesn't recombine, and this is key, and also carries out a phenotypic marker that is easily scored to a Santomea male, because that's the only direction that the chromosome goes. In the expectation that we are going to have two different types of projects. The chromosome that carries the balancer, in this case here, and an allele from some, and the chromosome from Santomea, in this case, there are not going to be any recessive alleles from Santomea being expressed in the hybrid. But there is also, we expect to actually see another second kind of project, that is that those females, those hybrid females that carry the deficiency map, the deficiency in the chromosome in the lamas, are going to be expressing all the recessive alleles that are in this Santomea chromosome. Thus, according to in, in the case that these alleles in the Santomere chromosome don't actually affect high reviability. If these alleles have a deleterious effect, we're going to see zero or very little of this of, of, of this hybrid flies over to this one. The nice thing about this experiment is that it's what it provides us an internet controlling is that we're comparing systems that are homogeneous for the pretty much the functionary background, and we can actually know that uh, the effects are being caused by the Excessive alleles exposed in this particular area. So I know that this is a busy slide, but I just honestly haven't found a better way to present it. Uh, the, we covered the whole genome by using this technique, and we found uh, the, the blue lines, the blue bars represent alleles that are in, uh, that was highly viability in Santomea and Melanogaster, and uh, red bars represent alleles that cause highly viability but in the Melanogaster similar structure. So, as you can tell, there are many, many, many more blue bars than red bars. To be more precise, there are 71 alleles that cost highly viability, highly viability between the melanomaster and the red, and 10 loci that cost highly viability between the melanomaster and the red. You can tell that the more recent cross has way fewer highly viability 